There I am. Sorry about that. I don't oh. really use a lot of Zoom. It's all good. It's all good. I use it every day and I'm still fucking it up. So fair. Fair enough. Thank you uh, for taking the time to come on here, man. I've actually been really, really looking forward to this conversation. Oh, shit. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's quite an opportunity. I appreciate it. Oh, man. Thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, some of, some of the most uh, interesting conversations are the ones that I kind of hold near and dear to my heart. And tattooing is definitely one of those things that I've been fascinated with since I was a little kid. Um, okay. Got, got my first tattoo when I was 16. It was one of those things I was like always drawing on myself as a child and had temporary tattoos and like forced my mom to go and sign the paperwork with me right as I was old enough to do it. And uh, I know a handful of people who have gotten into it um, and, and tattoo for a living. And uh, they all have very unique and different reasons why they're where they're at. And it's, it's never been just like a, oh, you know, I just decided I wanted to be a tattoo artist. And I went on that path. It was kind of like it found them in a way. And so definitely wanted to dive in and, and understand how you got to the place that you're at today. And then obviously we can kind of dive into wherever else it goes from there, but. It definitely found me. Like I never set out to be a tattoo artist. Um, I was hanging out inside tattoo shops. I begged my mom to take me when I was 17. This is back in Illinois when you could sign for somebody underage, right? So she took me to a, a tattoo shop called Daddio's and it was this old ran down gas station that they turned into a tattoo shop. It was close to my, my house I grew up in. And a guy named Isaac did my first tattoo. It was a mystery skateboard company logo on my wrist. You know, emo little skateboarder, get the broken heart tattoo on the wrist, wear your heart on your sleeve. I was not the cool kid in school after that. But uh, after that, I was like, man, tattoo shops are cool. I want to hang out inside more of them. I turned 18, started going to hardcore shows before that, you know, just being part of that scene. Everybody had tattoos growing up. Uh, you know, you see them everywhere. They're cool, right? I want that little badge on me. I want to be covered like this person. And then, you know, after I started hanging out at tattoo shops more, I started getting more tattoos. And one thing led to another, and I got offered an apprenticeship. I was going to school for graphic designs and, uh, and fighting MMA when I was 22, 23, and I got offered an apprenticeship and I jumped on it. I quit going to school and started tattooing. And the rest has just been downhill from there. So or uphill, whatever way you want to go. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess it depends on how you look at it. So it's, it's fair to say then you had some artistic ability growing oh, up. Yeah. yeah. I was in art class every year in school. Um, you know, even after I started tattooing, I was still taking art classes here and there. So art was just something that was a part of me being a skateboarder, being an MMA, uh, playing in bands. It was just all, all forms of art, drawing, painting. Uh, one time I was in like eighth grade and I was drawing a picture of my teacher. Uh, it was pretty accurate, a little cartoon of him. And he took me out to the hall and said that I'm dumber than the brick wall. And I'll always remember that because like over one of my drawings, this teacher just ripped me apart, put me down, told me I was dumber than a brick wall. And then years later, I become a tattoo artist and, you know, they make a drawing for a living. I used to skip class to go to in-school suspension because if you were late in high school, they would just send you to ISS and yeah. you'd have to sit there for the hour. And I would just skip it to draw and I would draw whatever I wanted to at that point because there's no class. So I would just sit there have fun, listen to my headphones, doodle. And then I never thought it would be my, my income one day. So how long of a process is that from the time that you get asked to apprentice until you're actually, you know, putting your, putting your name out there and, and accepting, you know, people, I guess you're, you're accepting people and who are willing to accept you while you're in that process and really like practicing the craft. But you know, how long of a process is that to develop your skills enough where you feel comfortable to, you know, be professional? Mine was about eight months. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready at all. Like, uh, 
they threw me into it. The shop that I first got my apprenticeship at was called Skin Candy in Rockford, Illinois, and that's my hometown. Uh, they threw me into like just trying to tattoo people. They they first brought me on to teach me how to pierce, and we were doing five dollar piercings back then, which is like that hardly covers the body jewelry we were putting into people. And so I, I was piercing. And then the owner was like, no, you're going to tattoo. Like, you have to tattoo. You're going to be a good tattooer. I was like, I was scared shitless, man. I didn't want to, I didn't want to mess up anybody and have them live with that. And then finally I did a tattoo on my friend that was staying with me. And I completely missed the first line. This is like four months into my apprenticeship. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea how to hold a tattoo machine. I, I was lost and they just threw me into it. And then that shop got closed down because that guy was piercing underage girls uh, at the shop. So the city just came in and shut that shop down. And I, I was out of a job because that was my like source of somewhat of an income while I was fighting MMA back then. And so I moved to Wisconsin and then I apprenticed under a couple people there at a shop called Lake city. And they probably had me apprentice for about eight months. And then the owner of that shop was like, all right, I'm going to go out you can't say no to anything that comes in. If you say no, you're gone. So all this stuff was coming in. It was a busy, busy shop. There's two shops in this town. So I got thrown into the wolves and I just had to buckle up and figure it out because if I said no, I would get fired. So I figured out as best as I could. And I did some bad tattoos, really bad ones. I didn't understand the concept of shading much or I could do lines well. I was committed to the lines. So like I was good on that, like names, little symbols, stuff like that. I never really botched a line, but the shading was disastrous. And, you know, it wasn't until about three years into tattooing where I started feeling really comfortable with like taking clients as walk-ins. You know, a lot of that was self-doubt because it's like, shit, they want this. I don't really know how to do that. But now when somebody asks me for something, I'm like, yeah, I got this. This is whatever. I've done this a million times and this will be my 10th year of tattooing. Okay. Yeah. And are you, I see you do a lot of like American traditional stuff. Is that your, is that kind of your like favorite style to tattoo in or just some- 100% like I wanted to start tattooing to do the flat traditional stuff. And then over time it just started changing more and more and traditional artists got better and better. Like mm-hmm you're not going to see flat sailor Jerry stuff and then be booked up anymore. It's going to be like, Oh, that thing's a whatever tattoo. So I started doing different line weights, doing color blends and trying to change my traditional to make it stand out a little bit more. And I got to this point and it's, yeah, it's still my favorite thing to do. If I can put a fat line on something next to somebody else's tattoos, make mine stand out a little bit more, do my color blends. It's, it's super cool. They always leave and they're like, I need to get more from you. And I'm like, yes, there's my clientele building. Hell yeah, dude. Now I I noticed it. I, uh, you know, it's probably really cliche, especially, you know, inside of the the community or maybe not, but I loved watching anything tattoo related on television and Oliver Peck and his kind of focus and always kind of being big on traditional artwork really got me into that. And it's, it's funny because like when I was younger, I was really into certain styles, like a lot of realism and portrait type stuff. And I would spend hours looking at it online. And as it's evolved on me, I've come to appreciate what, what was, you know, I guess at the time I thought the most basic form of tattooing, but in, in a way, I think it accentuates all of the technique in tattooing because it's very naked and there's not a lot of ways to hide your mistakes. Not at all. And there's certain ways to do traditional tattoos too. You have to have X amount of black, X amount of skin tone. You can't use these colors without these colors. Like I've seen people that think traditional is super easy and just botch the tattoo because they overshade something, leave no skin tone, put no black into it. And it's just like, man, you have to like know how to do a good tattoo if you want to do a good traditional tattoo. Uh, Traditional has always been my favorite. Uh, It's just been like, you get a tattoo now, and in 2055, it's still going to look like the same tattoo. 
Mm-hmm. That's what I love about traditional. I saw, I see traditional tattoos from like the seventies, the sixties. You can still tell it's a skull and crossbones. You can still tell there was an eagle. Like it just holds up the best forever. And then you see like a realism rose three years later. And you're like, yeah, what is, is that it? pink cabbage? Like, what do you have going on there? <laughs> I, I think traditional is just like, it stands the test of time in tattooing and it always will. And the more it evolves, the better it's going to hold up over time. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. Have you, uh, I'm assuming you've tattooed yourself at some point. Oh yeah. A couple of times, nothing super cool, but just little messing around here and there. I did a Johnny Cash on my thigh and upside down kind of black and gray portrait style. And that's about the biggest one I did. Other than that, nothing really awesome at all. Yeah. One of the guys that I was mentioning earlier who does tattooing, he uh, he was he was never, at least from my understanding, he never was like artistic in nature, um, at least never more than just like doodling stuff. I never knew him as like somebody with a lot of artistic talent, but creative, yes, and willing to try new things, definitely. He was just right. he was just that guy that was always pushing the limits of, you know, whether it was riding a street bike or taking an off-road vehicle or guns or jumping out of airplanes. Like he just was that guy. And we lost touch for a little bit moving into different areas. And I started like seeing on Facebook that he was tattooing his own leg and he started down by his ankle and he like literally worked his way up his entire thigh. I think it's his left leg and probably got about like halfway done with it and started to tattoo friends and then really started to like have a small business where he was, you know, booking clients. But when I talked to him about it, he was like, I just didn't feel right fucking up somebody else's life until I like really put myself to the test. And like, you know, having my own leg and the skin disappear kind of forced me to like learn a lot quicker and, you know, yeah. kind of his way of doing it. But I mean, he's got a whole leg that as you like start at the ankle, it's pretty crude. And then as you start to come up, you can tell like, okay, here he's like a year and a half in and it's, it's getting a lot better, but. Yeah. It takes a lot of trial and error. Like there's plenty different forms of, a uh, of media of, uh, can't think of the word that I'm trying to use, but like of art, you know, you can draw on paper, you can paint a canvas, you can, you can do all this stuff, but there's nothing like tattooing skin. Mm-hmm. like that is the most abrasive thing you can do to somebody it's intimate and you know it doesn't blend like a normal piece of paper would so you have to figure it out I never started tattooing on myself my first one was on my friend and I completely missed the first line I ever tried to pull I went right next to it but I was committed and then after that I was like okay maybe I should try to tattoo myself I did a little one on my leg it's always the easiest to do the leg right yep. like yeah let's just start down here and we got this but yeah, man, you have to learn really quick, you know, just even taking walk-ins, not having a clientele. It's crazy. Like I know a black and gray portrait artist that is amazing. Like, and he's booked up a couple years in advance and he taught himself how to tattoo in prison. Like just sheer talent, getting a tattoo machine, figuring out how to use the one, make one in prison. Like his prison tattoos I've seen him do are better than most black and gray portraits that people do out here. And you just like see him and now he's booked up and you're like, man, like a lot of tattooers have that success story where I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And now I have six months of clients and I'm just learning more and more each day. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed like an increase in the popularity of it? or a decrease in the popular like I feel like there was a time where it was like really trendy and everybody was getting a tattoo and you kind of like had you know tribal bands like everybody's uncle was getting a tribal band everybody's aunt was getting like a butterfly on her ankle or some sort of thing on their lower back exactly like that I get a tattoo because it's something I've always wanted to do they bring in it's not so much tribal armbands and but actually not so much tribal armbands but there's still butterflies all the time like if you go a week without tattooing a butterfly then then you got lucky right like everybody every lady wants her first tattoo to be a butterfly from like 
it's always like moms and like 65 year old women that get these butterflies sometimes like you get the occasional 80 some year old woman that comes in for a first tattoo and it's always a butterfly or like a cancer ribbon or something for a story but butterflies i think are always going to be trendy tribal armbands barbed wire kind of died out and got replaced with like mandalas and geometric work that's kind of a new tribal mm-hmm. uh heavy black works kind of new tribal where it's just like you got a solid black arm or like mandalas stuff like that but traditional is always going to be like the test of time like it takes like a tattoo collector to come in and get like a good traditional tattoo mm-hmm but I take walk-ins all the time at the shop I work at. We're probably one of the busiest shops in Austin here. And you just never know what's coming in. I've had people come in and get their penis and vaginas tattooed. I've had men come in that get like, do not resuscitate across their collarbone. Those people are kind of weird, all of them. Like, <laughs> you never know, especially when somebody comes in for that. You're like, are you going to go kill yourself after this? What are you going to do when you leave here? It just kind of makes me feel uneasy. Yeah, but I say no to a lot of stuff, especially like that. Some like twenty-five-year-old just came in a few weeks ago, wanted a pile of cocaine tattooed on him. Not my thing. Not doing that for you, dude. I'm sorry. He was super offended. He's like, "But you're a fucking tattooer. You gotta do everything." No, I'm not doing that. Yeah. No, I mean your name's tied to that. Or at least you know, I, I can follow. I I'd have to imagine you hear all kinds of stories. I mean, to your point, like you get people coming in with like super weird requests, but in a lot of ways, tattoos are a very cathartic experience. I know for me, like I have a tattoo in remembrance of my grandfather and, you know, for me, just even the, the session itself was very, you know, it it means more than just a a tattoo. You know, I have others. It was kind of like, Hey, it was my first tattoo. It's kind of a cool experience. And I even have some where it was just in the moment. It seemed like a really cool thing and, you know, probably was stupid, but in, it, I can appreciate it for what it was. But, right. you know, do you get a lot, I, I would imagine, a, you know, people coming in with really interesting stories tied to the artwork that they're getting on themselves? Everybody has a story for what they want. Like, even if you don't want to hear the story, they have a story for you at some point, like you don't always like need to know a story sometimes like just come in get a cool tattoo have it be that that's why i like traditional a lot like you post a design somebody's like i want that right but when you take walk-ins or like people seek you out on instagram whatever it be they always have a deep story tied to what they're getting though it'd be losing a mom a grandmother father and You know, you just kind of try to take it, listen to it. Sometimes I've heard stories that have just completely ruined my day Mm -hmm. where it's just like, oh, fuck, I could have went without knowing that. Now I feel awkward even doing this or you just feel bad for the person. But I always try to connect with everybody. I try to find some form of mutual ground where it's like I can relate to them. So it'd be like a death in the family or just struggling with hardship, bad thoughts, whatever it be. You know, it's it's easy. It's just to try to like be understanding, relate to them. But man, some of the stuff I've heard is so out there. Like this lady came in one time and she her first tattoo, I'll never forget this lady. She got the word dominated as a tramp stamp, the lower back tattoo. Thick black letters across the whole lower back, right? She wanted a number eight in there. Cool. I can't say anything. I'll do your tattoo. I start tattooing her. I'm like, so what is this for? She's like, well, I was in the mix of getting a couple of different tattoos. I wanted a tattoo for my daughter, but like this one's more important right now. Okay, cool. Why the eight? Well, my boyfriend has an eight inch penis. What? Okay. I just head down tattooing. (laughs) All right. Finish it up. Clean tattoo. Have a good day. She comes back. All right. I want an eight tattooed on my ring finger. Okay, cool. You love this guy. Stuff's getting serious. Let me put that eight on your ring finger. Third time. She gets his initials and another another eight on her whole pubic hair area. I can't say no to this. This is a funny story. Like, yeah, you're already, I say no to pass that up? You're already in deep. I'm already. Point. Yeah. So at this point, I'm like, okay. I have to know about this guy. 
Who is he? What's he do? Why is he so special? I'm like, what do you guys do for fun? It's hard to have conversation when your face is like in somebody's like area, right? Like, how do I make small talk? And this is super special tattoo for her. So I'm like, what do you guys do for fun? She's like, oh, you know, we just lay around, think about where to put eights on my body next. Okay, what's this guy do for work? Well, he's a doctor. And I'm like, I'm a nurse that works with him. Okay, good for you. That's awesome. Yeah, but this guy also has a, a wife and two daughters who he lives with. What? She's like, yeah, I know about all of them. They don't know about me at all. And he's just really special to me. And I'm just like, oh, my fucking God. I, I couldn't even know how to ask a question after that. I just tried to hurry up. I think I turned my tattoo machine up, just went to town. Okay, cool. Have a good day. See you later. I moved out of that stop, that city. I was in Madison, Wisconsin then. I got to Austin, so I've never seen that lady again. Hopefully, she got some good laser work or some <laughs> really good cover-ups because my shit is black when I put it in. It's hard to cover it up. Or, you know, maybe she just found another eight-inch dude. I have no idea. But people have told me some deep, deep stories that have like ruined my day. One time I was tattooing like a, it's probably like a butterfly on this chick's back. And she's like, my sister used to molest me all the time when we were younger. Out of nowhere, completely out of nowhere. And I was like, okay, what about it? She's like, well, this tattoo symbolizes change blah, 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 blah. I'm going through a lot of that right now, trying to get over this stuff. And it's just stuff I could have lived without ever hearing. And it was just so awkward because, you know, it sets a, it sets a tone. It sets an energy between two people. It's kind of hard to deal with. And then at the end of the day, after hearing this person, this person, this person, there's some days where I do 15 tattoos a day. So I hear 15 different stories that day. I need to have a drink after work. I don't know, man. It's just like, I need to wash this all away. I need to just sit down in the silence, not hear anybody's story right now. You think it's like, because they don't expect to run into you again. And so you're someone who you guys are kind of like intimately connected for that moment because you're permanently marking their body. And maybe it's also a way for them to deal with the pain or to take their mind off of it or, or whatever. But I mean, it is interesting, right? Because there's a lot of like, whether you're a barber, I was, I was uh, actually have a, a old friend who's a barber and we were going to do a podcast and it got tabled. It's one of the same things I was going to ask him. It's like, he has all these stories from people be, and it's like things that they don't tell anybody else, but they'll tell the guy cutting their hair, or the person giving him a tattoo. And it is like a big burden on you, but I can understand, especially t from a tattoo perspective, because there's a lot of weirdness probably tied into that, that it just impacts you a little differently. Yeah, for sure. I feel like they, they just share this intimate connection. And for that moment, that hour, two hours, whatever it be, you're talking to somebody and they, they open up and it becomes easy. We're kind of therapists on that level, just like a barber, hairstylist, like, people feel comfortable opening up to us and then you know sometimes they come back sometimes you never see them again sometimes they only get that one tattoo and they're off into the ether of life and you know if you can make anybody feel good enough to open up to you I think you're doing something right yeah this is kind of a funny story so like my my parents <clears throat> my mom had tattoos as I was growing up she actually it's funny she actually got tattooed at a house party and like a friend of hers had like a tattoo party, somebody that she knew came over and there was like a bunch of girls and people over there, they all got tatted up. And I remember going, my mom got a, a black Panther tattoo Nice. and uh, really, really cool, badass tattoo. And then she ended up getting a, a Jack in the pulpit, like a purple flower, same guy, same type of thing. Like two years later, um, this lady was doing it like Tupperware. You know, just having people, <laughs> but my dad never was into tattoos. And my, my parents went to Mexico when I was in high school. And my dad came back with this really, um, realistic parrot with like awesome feathers and a lot of great colors. And 
but kind of to your point, like the detail work was so much that over, you know, just the course of, you know, 10 years, it just faded a ton and right. still, still had good like outline and color to it. But he, uh, him and my mom had separated my dad's driving trucks and, uh, I ran into him. He was home, uh, just with a little bit of time off. And he was like, yeah, I got this new tattoo. He had stopped at this place in North Carolina and got some like tree branches added to this bird and kind of filled out the top of his shoulder. And he's like, you know, I might go down. I live in Pittsburgh. And he's like, I might go downtown and find a tattoo shop while I wait for you. I was working at the time. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Like whatever you want to do. Well, he since has now gone back to that same tattoo parlor like five or six different times. And over the course of wow. a year and a half, he's done, transformed his whole arm. So like, he's got a whole jungle theme all the way down, even on a, the top of his hand, he ended up getting like a big ape head on his hand. And uh, it's crazy because we'll drop him off and he'll be like, Hey, actually drop me off down the road. I'm going to have a couple of drinks with Greg and then we're going to go down. He's going to do, all the outline work, we'll probably come back and, you know, hang out and he'll spend a whole 12 hour day just like chilling with this guy. It's become his buddy. It's fucking, That's awesome. It's cool as hell, but I can only imagine what this poor guy has had to listen to from my dad telling him stories, which if it's not me, I'm sure it's absolutely hysterical. I've heard a lot of them over and over again, but. Right. They probably share stories with each other you know, they probably banter and oh, yeah. have a good time, especially if they're going out and having drinks together. Yeah. Like, we all want clients like that. Like we look forward to those clients where you can spend 12 hours with them, bullshit the whole time, go have a couple of drinks, come back, do a tattoo, you know, send them about their day, knowing that they're going to come back to you and you do all this work on them. Mm -hmm. People become pretty close and they become friends out of it. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Like, it's, it's... What was it like seeing your dad get covered over time now? It was awesome. Absolutely yeah. awesome. Yeah, man. It's all, uh, I'll send you some photos on Instagram. I'll cool. send you your DM. That's uh, really, really neat because he went like, he went all in. And this guy used some really cool, uh, like used a lot of negative space for okay. for creating some, some really cool effects to some of the stuff that he has. And uh, just a lot of really bold and bright colors, some more, a lot of flowers and a lot of cool animals and stuff. So yeah, it was neat. Yeah. He, he really, really like, as it was getting progressed, you could tell like he started to really fall in love with the process. And now he's already designed right. the whole other arm for, you know, kind of like what that's going to look like. So that's awesome. You know, they say you can't just get one tattoo. So that parrot was just like putting his foot in the water. Mm -hmm. And then over time, he's just like, I'm going to dive right in. And now he's got another whole sleeve going on. That's super awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. And you can tell like he's shit. My dad's in his late fifties right now. Cool. So he, it's kind of cool to see somebody with like really, really bold and bright, fresh looking sleeves mm -hmm. at that age. You know what I mean? It's, it's, cool. yeah. It, it's cool tattooing older people too, because it's like my kids had this back when they were in their twenties or I took my daughter when she was 18 and I said, I'll never get one. And then next thing you know, they're in the shop, getting a couple of different tattoos, creating a bond with somebody. And, you know, I, I love that. I love when people are able to do that, like change their mind over time. They go from looking down on tattoos to getting tattoos. And, you know, it, it's just there needs to be more people that are open like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you had anybody that's ever come in, started getting tattooed and couldn't finish the session and left with something like half done completely. When I first started tattooing clients, like I think I was tattooing a cross on this guy, like some small intricate cross and instantly he was like, fuck this. I should have smoked a joint before coming in. This guy was probably 45, 50. And I was tattooing a cross on him. And he was uh, my friend's uncle. And she's like, Hey, just be cool around him. He's like Christian guy whatever it be and his first words were fuck this i should have smoked a joint before coming in her mouth dropped she had no idea in the whole i was like we don't got too much longer like this is gonna be a quick tattoo he's like nope we're fucking done we're done so he has like i think he has like five six lines of a cross 
I don't know if anybody ever finished it or what, but other than that, like I was tattooing this girl last night for like three hours and she just gets sore. You know, you wipe it, that stuff burns no matter how much green soap you use in it, it's still going to burn over time. And you always can make another session, stuff like that. So that's normally what I'll do now is just like schedule another session. Okay, we got this far in this. It'll only take like two hours to finish and you come back, finish it up, go about your life. But nobody really backs out anymore that I've had. That was the only guy. Yeah, I always think about that. It's like my biggest fear, especially when I go a while and haven't gotten one. I know that I can get through it. I've had tattoos in some pretty painful spots. And so right. it's like going in and getting work done isn't a big deal, but it's like, man, I couldn't imagine getting partway through this and not being able to finish. Well, some people have never experienced any pain before, right? Mm. Like think about the people that hardly stub a toe or they just have this very kosher life and then they go in for a tattoo and it's just this huge shock to their body. And now you're stuck there for an hour and a half or whatever it be. They don't know how to handle that. They don't have the mental toughness to be like, okay, I got this. Bite the bullet. We're we're in now. It's just like, no, I give up. And I just try to help people through it. Nope, you got this. Five more minutes. Every tattoo would be like five more minutes. But really, it's like an hour and a half left. <laughs> mm-hmm. You just keep telling them five more minutes, five more minutes. It kind of helps people. But at the same time, they're like over it. Like the girl I was tattooing last night was just completely over it. And I was like, all right, we're done with the lines. We got some of the shading in. Just come back in like two and a half weeks. We'll be good. And other than that, that's how it is anymore. Just like get to different sessions. But I wish more people would stop within a few lines of it because then I would get paid for doing half the work. <laughs> <laughs> is there a consensus? This is kind of a stupid question, but it's the I guess it's the thing you like have dumb conversations with people. It it seems like it's places where there's a lack of like uh, sunlight or people touching like the inside of your arm is really tender uh, your neck you know things like that but I mean is there a spot that's just clearly by far the most painful place to be tattooed I've heard like the the breastbone is pretty pretty intense probably uh I have a few spots that aren't tattooed I'm guessing like the back of a knee would suck really bad or like an armpit uh sternum does suck I got my sternum laser like right under here. That was excruciating. I was like dry heaving while she was lasering me. But anywhere that's like super sensitive where you have to stretch it out, mm-hmm. I say like if you're ticklish in an area, it's going to suck even more getting it tattooed. Like I'm not really ticklish. So I've been able to sit through my tattoos very well, but some people are just like little tickle factories mm-hmm. and everywhere on them, super ticklish, like tattooing the top of a foot and you're just twitching the whole time because it hurts and it's sensitive. But man, I would say ribs probably, which sucks because everybody wants to tattoo on their ribs. They're moving the whole time. They're breathing and you're trying to time that breathing with your tattoo like trying to pull a line and they're just like up and down it's like somebody's taking a piece of paper going like this while you're trying to pull a straight line across it because they can't handle the pain like 18 year old girls coming for their first tattoo they want a word going down their ribs it looks like an ekg line when you're done yeah and you're trying to tell them sit still the whole time they have no idea what you're getting into so every time somebody comes in for the first tattoo on the ribs i'm like all right you're in you got this i'm going to try to time my lines with your breathing and just help them out and luckily they're not getting like big pieces that involve shading and color and stuff like that they're just getting line work so it can be done pretty quick mm-hmm. but i would guess like ribs back of the probably like back of the knee i've been kicked in the head a couple times tattooing people there so every time i'm just like uh let's keep this leg away from me i'll be over here yep Uh, I've tattooed a few kneecaps where people are just like biting their lip the whole time, not breathing, but elbow, my elbow sucked. My head sucked. Getting my head tattooed is not fun. And I wouldn't be like, yeah, let's tattoo your head if you have nothing else tattooed. But yeah, you know, some people would just. Yeah, I have my side done. That was what I went and did as a young kid. Got a, a big thing that says carpe diem down my side. And I just remember starting that and being like, motherfucker, like this is, 
again, that just that fear of like, I, I can't not finish this now. And I had like friends there with me that wanted to come and watch and you're trying to be a hard ass, but I could feel yeah, it right in my teeth. Every time he'd go over one of my ribs, it was just, that was excruciating. Coil machines where it's all loud and like, mm -hmm. yeah, luckily those are pretty old school. Now everybody's running a coil machine or a rotary machine now. And it's quiet. So like, I think that takes away half of the pain and everything. Cause you're running in this straight direct drive rotary that doesn't have to be tuned. You're not chewing anybody up. It's not loud. It takes away all that out of the, the pain and fear of a tattoo. But you can't, if you're getting carpe diem, you can't back out of that. You got to seize the day, man. Exactly. <laughs> right. You can't just get carpe. Exactly. No, it's so people true. still get that tattoo all the time. Like that is one of the tattoos that people will get for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it's, it's the one I forget that I have the most, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've got the whole gamut. I have carpe diem on my side. I've got a, my first one was like a tribal bird that I part, like I found two different tribal designs online and I superimposed them in my graphic design class in high school and like traced one over the other to create. Cause I wanted my own, unique tattoo that I that wasn't something online so I was like what better way to do that than to take two already existing tattoos and merge them together and the guy was like yeah I'll do that for you sure you're 16 your mom signs on for it that's awesome so was that in Pittsburgh um it was in a small town of Bradford PA okay Alley Inc is it still uh is that still like, can you still have a mom take you to sign at 16? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I, um, I think so. There was a, that's crazy. Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know if the state of Pennsylvania has changed that or not. There was, I know a, in Texas you can't really. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to tattoo a 16 year old. Like thinking about tattooing a 16 year old girl on her ribs or anything like that, where like their shirt has to come up or, oh. You know, yeah. like upper thigh area. It's just what's a lot of trouble. Of all? Yeah, a lot of trouble. And I want nothing to do with that. Like, I don't care if God comes in and signs for you. I'm not tattooing you under 18. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that could be a little bit of a risk. I could see for sure. Yeah. Especially now, like, you, you can't do that stuff. So I hope every state just gets on board of 18. Mm hmm. So a little bit of a segue, but I see you got your, your reverent jujitsu stuff on. So I know you're, that's your brand, right? Yes, sir. This is my company, uh, along with a couple other, my buddies, we, we are a trio and we started a jujitsu clothing company. How long you been rolling? I know you're at 10th planet, right? No, sir. I'm at a uh, Val BJJ uh, oh, okay. village of wolves and uh 10th planet people are monsters, but we're a smaller gym. My coach is super awesome, big in the leg lock, stuff like that. We're called Val. Uh, his last name is Villa Lobos, and which stands for Village Wolves in Spanish. So that's what the gym's called. Oh, and yeah. I've been rolling since like 2009, 2010, but not consecutively, right? So like I've moved, I've had to work, I've spent years not training i spent years training but i've been back rolling for like four years straight now and i'm never stopping again i don't care what i have to do that's interesting that you bring that up that's very similar to myself i got it like i fought amateur mma like 10 years ago i had a fight uh in ohio and got put into a rear naked and dislocated my jaw and <laughs> made me realize really quickly, like, okay, there's more than just uh, being an athlete and somebody that wants to get in a cage. There's real right. people with, with skill. And I mean, this is fucking amateurs, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it humbles you very quickly. And it got me interested in jujitsu and I've started and stopped. And a lot of the time it's been because of injury. A lot of the time though, it's, you know, injury and then life kind of gets in the way of that. What was different this time for you? picking it back up where you can consistently be with it for four years, because I'm assuming life didn't get any easier over that time. You just found ways to incorporate it. Yeah. I didn't let life get in the way. 
I knew that no matter what I had to do, I had to get to the gym, even though like I I lived in Wisconsin. I started training before I moved back to Wisconsin again at a UFC gym here. And then that kind of just sparked the jujitsu in me. And then I moved back to Austin and was training all MMA again and not to fight, but I started competing in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And at that point I was like, Oh, this is the most important thing in my life right now. And ever since then, it's just like, I'm not letting anything get in my way. This is number one in my life. I'll leave work early. I'll go into work late. Like I'll sacrifice everything else I need to, because I'd much rather just be on the mats rolling than dealing with everyday life. Like that's, my favorite thing in the world right now. Mm -hmm. So like hardship of life, it all goes away when you're on the mats. And that's the way I never looked at it before. Right. So now that I see it that way, I'm like, that's my therapy. This is where my friends are. This is where my happiness is. And, you know, just being there rolling, I'm not going to let anything get in the way again. Other than that, it's just all excuses. Right. How has this pandemic, is that, imp- I know Austin's kind of been an interesting experiment for COVID and, you know, all the rules and regulations. I was there, I have a coffee company and supp- natural supplement company that we have headquartered down in Austin. And I was drinking your coffee now. Oh, fuck. Yeah, dude. <laughs> How do you like the it? The ambition. I love it. Awesome. I love it. I've been telling everybody that they need to try action coffee. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad that yes, you sir. like it. I'm so glad you like it. Yeah, it's. I was down in Austin uh, with Rumble Johnson, and it was like right in the, you know, heart of. I think it. I was down there in August, and um, it was like you know, I think it was actually probably after people were kind of sick of the first wave of everything happening, and really before the election got to be you know, I think probably a catalyst for more restrictions and regulations, but I mean, you kind of had a double whammy. I know, you know, jujitsu gyms, even here in Pittsburgh, we're putting paper over the windows and, you know, trying to get creative and on how you train and be safe because, you know, there's, you know, nobody wants to, you know, get their rolling partner sick, but then you also from, you know, a tattooing perspective, I would imagine had to deal with a lot of that as well too. I mean, without, incriminating yourself i mean how did you get through all of this and continue to get through it i had no idea what to do for a while like there is some point where i couldn't do either one and i started questioning who i was because like i just always have had jujitsu or a martial art or something and i read victor frankel's man search for meaning where he was in the concentration camps he saw his mom and dad his pregnant wife go one way he had to go the other way and uh in these concentration camps he had to work all day just to get some pea soup and this was during quarantine when i was like not doing anything and i was like okay it's gonna get better like this guy suffered through all this in the concentration camps i'm at home reading books playing video games drawing it'll be okay and my the owner of my gym was like, okay, we can roll just in small groups and uh, no classes, obviously. But he's like, if you get a small group together, you and one other person wants to go roll. Here's the code to the gym, go in anytime. Just like let other people know. We have a Facebook group where we're all in. So we're just like, hey, anybody want to roll? I'm going to go at this time. I was able to start rolling and then I started taking matches for like fight to win and submission hunter. So I'm like, I have to train if I'm competing. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. so I was just in there with as many groups as I could. And I would only go to jujitsu, go home, grocery store, stuff like that. We were all really safe. And I think out of everybody that trains at the gym, only like three people have caught COVID and you know, it's just, through this time, I just read books and trained. And that's what really helped me out a lot is knowing that other people have struggled way harder. And this seemed like a little slap on the wrist, like a little, like, like, yeah, like you're grounded as a little kid, right? Like, oh, shit, I'm quarantined. I can't go to work. I can't go to jujitsu. Like, what am I going to do? So I started lifting weights more and 
figuring it out and finding my way. And then the small groups helped me and it helped tune in my game too, because I'm not going to learn classes. I have to study now, right? If I want to learn during this time, I have to study more jujitsu. So BJJ Fanatics has been a blessing and, you know, just being able to learn as much as possible and then going back with a completely different game of jiu-jitsu helped out too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, that's, it's so cool to hear that, you know, and what was the name of that book that you said you were reading? Victor Franco. Uh, he's the author and it's called Man's Search for Meaning. That book is one of my favorite books I've ever read. And I couldn't put the damn thing down once I started it. Uh, it's just like he had such a hard time in these concentration camps, but he gave himself hope by telling himself, like, I'm going to see my wife one day. I'm going to raise our kid this way. My parents are going to, we're all going to go out to eat, stuff like that. They all went to die. He knew that, but he was like a psychiatrist. So he just told himself, he gave himself hope every day to get out of this concentration camp. And he was in four different ones over the time of, uh, like World War II in Nazi Germany. And, you know, it was just like reading that really helped me. And it gave me a search for meaning too, because it's like, that's when I started reverent. I was like, okay, uh, I have to do something. I can start a clothing company. I can do this. And my friend at the time was just like, I was heavy on thinking of starting a clothing company, journaling about it and stuff like that. Journaling helped me so much, putting my thoughts on paper. And then out of nowhere, I get a phone call. Hey, I'm thinking about starting a clothing company. I would like you to be a designer. As I'm journaling about wanting to do a clothing company. So it's like, I kind of put it out there into ether. And a guy I rolled with a few times kind of bounced it back to me. We found a third person. And now we have Reverend. And without quarantine, it probably would never happen. Yeah, it's, I've been trying to look at this whole situation as, you know, I, and I, I believe this in almost all cases where there's chaos, there's opportunity. And 100%. You know, there's a lot of people who, and I try to break this down like the best way, and I hope this makes sense. You know, for, for instance, for you, right? Like there's a market of people who you'd be competing with in your given industry, whether it be, you know, tattooing or, you know, in creating, um, you know, jujitsu apparel. And then there's like a certain amount of people that when shit like this happens, they cower up inside and they take themselves out of the game. Right. And there's going to be an opportunity to take market share, so to speak, of whatever it is that you're into just by being in the game and willing to play. And I've right. seen so many people who are so talented that when something like this happens, whether it's because they've never you know, gone through difficult times. And so it's a shock to their system, but they, they run from it and they miss out on massive opportunities because they're afraid, you know? And I, I love, as soon as you mentioned that book, I kind of, I was like trying to remember as you were talking, I didn't want to interrupt yeah. you because that's so dead on. It's like, we live in this time where like myself included, like I, it's impossible to, go through a day without having just these luxuries that we take for granted that make our mm -hmm. lives so much easier. And you really do have to seek out discomfort and it's hard enough to like deal with discomfort when it finds you, but to like actually go out and seek it through exercise and through challenge, whether, you know, even doing brain puzzles or, you know, whatever it is that you find difficult, people don't like to, to search that out, let alone go through it. And so, right you know, to get in that mindset and understand. And I'm a, I can imagine that book's a, a massive perspective enhancer. It is like, once I read that, I was like, you have to embrace the suck sometimes. Like I'm sure Jocko's always in my ear, uh, David Goggins watching them on Instagram, stuff like that. You're like, what would these guys do? You know, like I just have an inner Jocko calling me a pussy all the time. And David Goggins like yelling at me to get out and do something. And, you know, I've been through hard times. I've been through it. And this has been the weirdest time of my life, right? I've also had a divorce through these times. And, you know, my whole life has changed. But at the same time, my life has changed for the better. 
So like you can take that and just keep getting beat or you can find the positives in it and make something of yourself. Like that's what I wanted to do. Taking the easy road out of doing nothing and cowarding. I think that's probably the easiest thing most people could do. Oh, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to work. I don't have to do anything. I got a stimulus check coming. Mm-hmm. There's this grants. Here's unemployment. No, I never wanted that. I want to get out and work. I want to get out and prove myself that like we can always be better people. We can always learn more. We can always push ourselves through hard times. That's what makes us stronger. That's what makes us smarter. That's what makes us better people. And that's one thing I want to keep striving for. Like a hard time is easy to be defeated in. What makes people tough is like pushing through that, finding yourself, adapting, changing, growing, journaling, figuring your shit out. And that's what I've done the most over this. And, you know, like competition through all of it, like tattooing, I'll tell people go get tattooed by other tattooers. I want to share my clients with everybody. I don't want you just to come to me. That person does cool work too. Like go collect stuff from people. And then rash guards, everybody wears the same rash guard, right? You, everybody has a triangle design. Everybody has geometric stuff here and there. I just want to create something different. And then now I go to the gym and people are wearing my stuff and it's a super bittersweet feeling. And like, I don't know if I should take it easy on my rolls if somebody's wearing my stuff or not, because like they support me, but yet I have to practice my jujitsu and this person's wearing a reverent rash guard and shorts. And I'm like, okay, well don't be too hard on them, but they're trying to roll with me hard and my ankle just popped like shit. Okay. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. And they're like, Oh, good roll, man. Thank you. I want to buy another rash guard. I'm like, yes. You know, it's just like, just I finally found who myself was through this whole time. And now I know how to use myself for the rest of my life. I'm grateful for quarantine. I'm grateful for the hard times because it taught me so much. Not so, so man, I, I can relate. I, you know, I, I was doing a podcast before quarantine happened a while ago with my brother and it was, it was called bud brothers. And nice. Uh, I know some of the people who listen to this used to listen to that and he lives out in LA and we were doing some work at the time in the cannabis space and he still does that. Um, but it, it just kind of, it was tough me being in Pennsylvania, him being on the West coast, we were doing it on site on location with people in, in person and just the monotony of talking cannabis with every guest got just was, it was hard for me. I wanted to explore more things. And, um, I ended up having my first son, my first child, but, uh, my little boy, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, man. He, he was born last September. And so the year like 2019 was really in a lot of ways consumed with that. And, um, you know, and I had some other projects going on. My wife was a trooper, but when quarantine hit this whole idea of leveraging zoom, because of some of the things I was doing in my day job, I was like on zoom all the time. I'm like, how do I make the best out of a real shitty situation? And, and also realizing that like, there's a lot of people, you know, like yourself who are fun, want to, you know, hop on, have a cool conversation. You know, you've got a lot of interesting things that I think, you know, the people who listen to this are interested in, whether it be, you know, art, tattooing, jujitsu, just entrepreneurial spirit, um, you know, weird stories. I was talking about aliens earlier this week, <laughs> a dude that's a chess coach that lives down in Austin, ironically enough. Oh, right. Yeah. And it's like the conversation can just kind of go in these weird directions. But I, I was like, you know, on top of that, like, there's some people that because there's nothing to do, like people are looking for an outlet. So what mm-hmm. better way for me to like selfishly have conversations that I find interesting and that I want to have and that maybe I'll have archived someday, like be able to sit down with my son and be like, Hey, you're into this. Like, Hey, I actually did a podcast five or six years ago or 10 years ago with somebody you're into tattoos come check this podcast that I did. You know, like to me, I would love to be able to sit down with my dad now and, and go back through things. Like he'll show me old, old photos of, this, he had a Camaro, a 69 Camaro before I was born. And like, 
just seeing photographs of stuff like that and talking with him and hearing the stories was really cool. So like I had that in the back of my mind as well too, but going through it and having the ups and downs of it um, and thinking that it's something that it isn't and having it evolve into something that it is, you're right. You know, I learned things about myself in eight months of quarantine and really trying to, you know, how do, how do I make things work in this new world that right. even after life gets back on track, I'll take that with me. And I hope that I can pass it on to other people, you know, who yeah. maybe didn't pick it up right away or didn't have to because they, their circumstances were different. 100%. I, I totally agree with that because if I can't use what I've learned through this time to sit and talk with somebody to help somebody through self-help, that's why I've really indulged in it's like all the self help I can self help self help because it's so easy to get in your head. It's so easy for that little voice to just beat you more and more and more. It's so hard to counter your brain telling you that you're a piece of shit that you can't do this that you're stuck. Mm-hmm. Nobody's stuck. Nobody's stuck at all. You you just have to keep going and you know exactly what you said. You want to look back, show your kid a podcast. Like, how awesome is that going to be when your kid's like six and you're like, oh, you like this? Well, listen to what this guy said. And hopefully, like, now your boy can grow up and be like, my dad was a badass podcaster. I have all this material I can use. And like, he asked you all the questions for whatever he wants to do with his podcast or whatever he does one day, you know, just like makes himself a good man because of the things you're doing. It's stuff that you're going to be able to look back on. Same with like looking back at the the Camaro pictures, right? Mm-hmm. Like your boy's going to look back at my dad's podcast. Here they are. Here's the whole archive. Do you have them stored somewhere? Or are they in like a like a flash drive or a file somewhere that you're going to be able to pass on to him? Or are they just on all these media sharing sites? Now it's interesting. So, you know, they're, they're out on wherever, I I mean, I know it's on Apple and Spotify and Amazon and Pandora and like a bunch of other small little things that pick up the RSS feed. Um, But I, I store them in a cloud repository that I have. And then I have a, like a, just a standalone hard drive just in case, you know, cause I don't know, I'm weird about it. I have all every clip, every raw footage, every finished episode and just kind of sort it out that way a nice little that hard drives that hard drive is going to be something that you're going to be able to pass on to him mm-hmm. the cloud stuff might all just disappear one day it could and you're like oh shit this was all here yesterday now it's just it's gone what happened but that hard drive you're always going to have that and hopefully he'll always have that because i mean usbs aren't going anywhere right no nope. like, you can't just get rid of those things you can't just get rid of a hard drive I could still go watch a VHS video if you if you have a exactly. VCR, right? I mean, it's still a movie. Exactly. Your your dad sharing those Camaro pictures with you, right? It made me think of my grandfather. He had a uh, a Hemi Cuda. It was purple. He loved that thing. There was flames painted down the side. He used to pick up chicks in it all the time. He didn't give a shit. <laughs> and he used to take me in it while he would pick up these chicks, and it just brought back that memory. And it's just like sharing stuff like that i haven't thought about that in a while it just brightens up somebody's day yeah no that's really cool what year 70 i think it was like a 76 or something like that yeah he had it all modified the engine was sticking out of the hood it was just super fast and then he went to prison and my grandma sold it on him because she's a jerk (laughs) should have kept it that would have been a million dollar car right now and she sold it but, you know, he loved that thing. And looking back to your dad's Camaro, he probably did the same. Yeah, man. That's that's the one thing, like, I measure my success with how I can help other people. I mean, I, I, love, right. I love treating myself. Don't get me wrong. I, I certainly do that enough, probably more than I should. But I think about it all the time. It's like, want to take care of my family, want to make sure my son grows up with, with everything that he could ever want. And and in some cases I worry about that too, because it's like, I want to give him everything that I didn't have as a kid, but I worry that maybe that will make him not the type of person that he should be. And that, you know, sometimes that struggle is a part of building the character that we need. So 
I, I, I'm trying to be careful of that, but uh, I definitely would love the opportunity to buy that car for my dad someday. You know, that's, like that's amazing. Yeah, that's the one thing. Like I things for both of my parents, but for my dad, like I think about that. It's like, man, you know, what a birthday gift that would be to be like, hey, you know, you sacrificed a lot. The you know him and my mom found out they're having me. He was young. He was like 24, and he sold the yeah. car. So wasn't going to fit a, a car seat in the back and you know it was more more valuable to him as cash in his bank account than it was yeah. to you know, be parked in the in the driveway but yeah I think about that man and you know who knows stranger things have happened I think how much cooler would that Camaro be now with oh. two tattoo sleeves right yeah like, right yeah. he'd be the coolest fucking dude ever yes he would no a hundred percent a hundred percent that would be really cool be really cool that would be you know it's cool that you want to do that because just giving back you know treating yourself is very important because you can't always just give right like you give life lessons but you also have to treat yourself to keep yourself in like check with yourself right Mm -hmm. like i try to treat myself here and there there'll be something like buying a book or a new tattoo machine. I just spent twelve hundred dollars on a new tattoo machine because I wanted to treat myself for Christmas. And I'm just like inside. I'm like, oh, that's so expensive. But then I've already done fifty tattoos with it, and I'm like, okay, this already paid for itself. Cool. Yeah. I'm happy with it. But like doing things for others, I think the best thing to do is passing on knowledge, passing on wisdom, passing on life lessons. You know, just that will be something somebody always remembers. Something that you give them or buy them can get lost. But your boy will always remember the life lessons you give them. They'll be struggling, not giving them everything. Or it'd be, hey, my dad gave me this Les Paul guitar. I'm going to shred it right now. You know, it's like the cool things like that. Yeah, that's really cool. No, it is. And you've got me thinking now because that's really been the foundation of humanity. And it's Mm -hmm. scary because all this, I mean, shit, dude, we're having this conversation because of technology and, you know, I'm, I'm preaching how, you know, taking advantage of all of what's here and I wouldn't change that, but I, I do wonder because all of that human connection, the passing on the lessons, you know, everything that you just said before there was technology, before there was the ability for me to, to save any of this stuff on a hard drive, it was just passing it on. It was right. sharing those experiences. It was dads having the conversations with their sons or grandparents with their grandchildren. And that was how we continued to evolve as people, you know, and it, and, and ultimately mm-hmm. got to a place where we created technology. And I think, I mean, fuck man, who knows? I don't know if you, how crazy you get into things, but it's every day I turn the news on. It's like, Oh, another blue orb falls from the sky in Hawaii under the water. Right. You're like, oh, shit. There are aliens under there. I I don't watch the news. I can't do it, dude. Like, on Instagram, I saw what was going on in Alabama after they won the championship. And I'm like, oh, coronavirus is here for another, like, eight years. But we're still learning lessons. Like, I learn lessons every day from the Stoics still. Just wisdom that they've passed down. and you know, they, they've had the best way of thinking. You just like try to be a good person. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the best thing you can share with anybody. You just like try to be a good person, but like blue orbs falling into the water. Like I want to eat an octopus because I think that's an alien. It's scary. Yeah, <laughs> dude. I, they're fucking they're creepy little guys though. If you watch some of the YouTube videos of an octopus, I mean, I don't know if they change colors and shape shift and, I mean, they're they, punching fish. I saw there was the video of the one that like climbs out of its aquarium. And yeah, they're creepy. They're really they are creepy. So I see people like ordering octopus and squid while we go out to eat. I'm like, no, thank you. Well, why? Because it's an alien. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now it's, you know, like when things happen, like this whole coronavirus shit occurs and we're all like locked in our homes and at the end of the day, no matter how you split it, no matter how you view it, the reality is the reality. And I'm blown away that we're sitting here with this being the reality. But it's made me think about all of the other things that I am like, 
I would never think that this would, I would never think that the government would admit to having, you know, spacecraft that's not from this world and the Pentagon exactly. releases something like that. And it's like, I'm, I don't know what would happen if I was told, Hey, you know, aliens have already been here. Cause people have talked about it, right? Like, Hey, how, who made the pyramids? And it almost sounds silly if you're like, Oh, aliens have already been here. Maybe that's what made chimps evolve as quickly as they did into humans. Maybe there's been a little bit of like DNA hacking. I had people say that shit about like, what is his name? Hitchens. Um, I don't know who that is. Uh, what the hell is his first name? Zachariah Hitchens, I think is his name. And he's, his beliefs are kind of like that aliens interbred with, uh, you know, like lower hominids and ultimately that kind of led to humans. And I think if somebody would have told me that like five years ago, I would have looked at them and thought this motherfucker, yeah. like, on he, what, where do you get your psychedelics at? Well, you yeah, exactly. Something? You know, but now I'm like, it would just be like a Thursday, you know, I, okay. Yeah, sure. Do I get to go to work or do I have to stay at home? Can I go to the store? Like it, it just kind of falls into the typical news cycle. Wasn't there something in the new stimulus package that Trump signed that says we have to like, they have to tell us about the alien stuff in 180 days or something. Yep. Yeah, I can't wait for that. I can't yeah. wait to just be like, surprise, they're here. They're going grocery shopping with you. This grocery store, they're actually owned by aliens. You're getting tattooed by aliens now. And mm -hmm. that's life. Deal with it. Yeah. There's a, a guy, his name's Jeremy Corbell. He's, um, he's the guy that's kind of, been steering the ship for the bob lazar documentary he's he okay the documentary he was i think the one who brokered bob going on joe rogan's podcast and i just saw he recently put up a post talking about edward snowden because snowden Gosh. released some things and so it was like i never i didn't come across anything at all about aliens or ufos when i was looking through all of the information that i was looking through and I think, oh man, when I read that, I was like bummed out. But Jeremy Corbell made a good point. And he said, think about all of the information that we know has been shared with the military about things like UFOs. And for them to not find anything, even things that we know aren't true, says something like, where are they housing any of it? Because you didn't, you didn't see anything, like nothing that you even could dismiss would say that they're having or housing this information about aliens maybe in an even different place and that it might be on a need to know basis because you'd think you'd see something. Yeah, where are they housing all this? Like I watched some of the Snowden stuff and nothing about aliens and I'm just waiting. I saw I saw three UFOs when I was a child. At one time they were hovering in a triangle. Typical UFOs. My grandpa and I followed one down the road. It disappeared into the sky. The other ones disappeared pretty quickly. Never again have I seen anything like that. I probably will never see anything like that again. But at that point, I always believed there's something out there that we're not alone. There's something in the universe. There's something in the galaxies. Now I'm always just kind of been waiting, right? Like we're all playing this waiting game where we're humans here's aliens out there and i'm still just waiting for men in black to happen <laughs> i saw what i i mean I, I can't explain what i saw um and I'll, I'll tell you this quick little story i was my wife and i uh it was when we were first dating we were back home where i grew up in this small little town called bradford in northwestern pa right on the new york state line and in new york state across the border for where I live, there was an Indian reservation. I had a casino. It's like a 20 minute ride, a couple highways that you'd take straight drive. And I was following my aunt and uncle and my grandmother in the car that was in front of me. And we're driving on the highway. It's nighttime. And this glowing ball like appeared. And I, to say that it, like dropped out of the sky I don't know if that's the right explanation, but it, it kind of just like appeared in the sky and hovered for a second, very bright. And then it shot across the sky in front of us in a very straight path. 
and disappeared Whoa. off on the horizon. I mean, my wife and I both were like, holy shit, did you see that? And she's like, yeah, I saw it. And I tried to call my grandmother, but before I did, my uncle in the car in front of me called me and was like, did you guys just see that? And we were like, yeah. Like, so like both of us saw, I mean, it was very clear, like right in the sky in front of us. And two days later, it was in the newspaper that Whoa. people saw something and then it just like kind of never was talked about again. But I think about that and I'm, I'm like, I've had people explain to me, well, it was a shooting star. And I'm like, I've seen a shooting star before. Like, I, I definitely, if that's a shooting star, then we're in trouble because if that thing fucking hit Earth, we'd be in trouble. Like, that didn't look, it looked way closer than a shooting star. It was right there in the sky and it stayed put and then it took off. I've never seen a shooting star stop. And I don't know what that is. And I go, yeah, I mean, it was very mechanical. Uh, I don't mean mechanical is not the right word, but it just, it wasn't something falling it wasn't gravity pulling a you know a, a rock through the atmosphere it was directing itself it seemed you know? right it was traveling in like light speeds just as orb yeah i can't wait to the day where it's just open that they're among us mm -hmm. like we don't have the power to battle them. And I don't think they want to battle us, right? Like, if they wanted to go to war with us, like, now is the time for anybody to just be like, attack America, attack the country, whatever it be. Mm -hmm. I just think we're going to learn a lot, and we're not going to be able to handle it at first. And then the people that are the shooting star people, right? Yeah. They're going to have the hardest time accepting it the people that are kind of ready for it, they're, they're going to embrace it. They're going to love it. They're going to love like having an alien next door neighbor. But the shooting star people, they're going to go crazy. The, all their guns, all their ammo, all the stuff that they're trying to hoard, uh, it's not going to do any good. You ever hear Elon Musk talk? Oh, he yeah. swears he's an alien. I saw a video of uh, Mark Zuckerberg talking and he like stumbles over his words and says that he's not human and then like corrects himself and it very well could just be like a gaffe but he clearly says i was human once well i am human like and it's like he catches himself and it just makes you think like when you see how much i mean i don't know he seems like a normal dude kind of but he also right. seems a little little strange and you know i've seen him talking to the, the fucking house committees when he's been questioned and shit and it's i mean i guess that's what a computer guy who's that rich and maybe disconnected is but that's probably also how i would explain an alien if he was fucking talking to the government too you know like yeah i don't know uh, i one of my neighbors that i have you know i live in an apartment building and i have some weird quirky neighbors some are super cool some are kind of out there I was talking to one of them the other night and he was telling me, Hey, you got to feel my back. Why do I have to feel your back? He's like, I was abducted by aliens when I was younger and they put this metal metal in me. And now it's like a lump in my back. That's been there forever. And I'm like, I'm not going to feel your back, dude. Like the last thing I want to do is just like start touching your back. I didn't know what it was going to, what he was trying to turn it into it was just yeah. like outside talking. And let's I'm assume just... you were abducted by aliens and they did put metal in your back. I don't know if that's the thing that I want to be fucking touching right now. Exactly. I was like, no, I'm not going to touch you, dude. Like that's cool. It sucks that happened. Maybe it's awesome that it happened. You aren't what I would guess an alien would go after. But he's like, no, I have like, depression and shit from it now like where he's just living haunted because he was abducted by aliens that put some metal in him when he was younger and now he's just like suffering from it i guess Ugh. i'm like i don't know what to tell you man like but good for you like maybe harness that he swears that he was abducted by aliens and i'm like man, I, I don't know what they would want to do with you like you see like somebody like zuckerberg or musk or you're like okay aliens would want these people they're smart they can change them do whatever this guy doesn't seem that smart <laughs> well it seems like it would make sense right that i mean if there are aliens and they're watching earth 
this guy Elon's shooting shit out into space and you know like okay they were just down there building stuff and we'd come and keep an eye on them every once in a while now this guy's shooting rockets up at a record clip there's a fucking car floating around up here now like okay maybe we should go and have a talk with this guy yeah and, you know what i mean and uh, you know. i was listening to akira the don and uh he's like dj if yeah. you know who he is but i was listening to his elon musk mixtape and that that track about being an alien how he's like you don't want to be in my head you don't want to be me. You think it's fun, but you don't want to be me. That guy's mind is probably so out there that a normal person couldn't be him. Like anybody with a rational train of thought could not be an Elon Musk brain. I can see people that think they're aliens. Like, I don't know, we live in Austin. You have a bunch of girls running around with shaved heads that swear they're aliens. I don't buy that. But like somebody like Elon Musk. Zuckerberg, yeah, these people are also aren't aging at all. Like you look at Tom Cruise, is Tom Cruise an alien? He hasn't aged in how long? Like right. Mario Lopez, that guy hasn't aged since Dude, Saved by I, the Bell. I I literally <laughs> almost just said the same thing. I read some stupid article I got fucking baited into on <laughs> it was about like uh some of the meanest celebrity spouses, and it was talking about when he married Ali Landry. But the oh, photo no. of him was was older for sure it was older you could tell the haircut especially but i was like this motherfucker looks younger today than he did that was like probably the photo i saw today was like when he was on the college years when like oh, shit when he was you know back in the later stages of saved by the bell but it's like you see him on uh extra is it extra that he's on now or uh, one of those shows I don't know. I just see him randomly pop up on social media yeah. from time to time. Yeah. I don't know if it's stem cells or great Botox or whatever it be, but he's not aging. None of these celebrities are really aging like you think they would. It seems funny. Like none of these celebrities have died of COVID or whatever. Like, I don't know, man. I hope the day comes where there are aliens among us and we can all just live in peace and benefit and have a good time and start doing jujitsu or tattooing some aliens and see what life is like in 2024 yeah. and make the best of it a hundred percent i i hope you're right man i hope uh i hope we have another conversation in the next couple of years i hope that means that i'm still doing this that we're still connected and that the conversation is centered around some mind-blowing information around this that we can be like do you remember that first conversation we had? <laughs> we were talking about, you know, what if? Well, holy shit, man, we could have never imagined that it is what it is, you know, because I think we're we're on the precipice of it, you know? It just seems I don't I don't know how to make it if it's things are just crazy enough right now for that to to hit and you know, maybe it's not even aliens, maybe it's something completely different. But I hope so. Like who knows? I saw you had some uh some podcasts with some 10th planet people i'm sure those are super out there uh yes they are. i want to go back and listen to those and yeah see their probably, views i for some i don't know why i thought that you were uh, a part of 10th planet it's probably just i talk with so many of those guys from austin a lot of them gravitated towards some of the action stuff and uh, my partner was a former member of the on it executive team and so all right he's got some connections in there and they've been big supporters, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize it. What's the name of your gym again. I want to give that a, another plug. It's a bow BJJ B O W B J J. It's, you know, it's super small. We, we get the work done. We have a lot of 10th planet people in and out of there. I don't know if I should be saying that or not, but we're open. Like everybody comes and cross trains with us and yeah, yeah, we love it. Like we love having other people in our gym. We're not the typical gym where it's like, only we can train our stuff here and there. Like it's all secret. There's so many people that come in from different gyms and it just makes us feel like we're all doing something right. I coach there on uh, Wednesdays and, you know, we have a bunch of really good technical people and, you know, it's my favorite place in the world. Yeah, dude, I was watching some of your clips. I saw there's one that you have on Instagram where you catch a dude in a nasty heel hook. You're slick. 
And when you said that Thanks. you have a lot of leg locks and stuff, you guys focus on that. I could tell uh, you got yeah. some nasty game. Thank you. That was a fight to win, I believe. Yeah. Up in Dallas here. That was the last fight to win I did. I have applied for a few more of those coming up in February and March. So hopefully I'll be back getting highlights on fight to win again soon. Awesome. Now keep me in the loop. Let me know when. I definitely Will want do. to. Win. Where can people find uh, Reverend Jiu Jitsu? Uh, Reverend Jiu Jitsu.com or on Instagram. You can order it through myself or Adam Borshig or Sean O'Neill. Um, it, it's new. We're, we have a bunch of stuff coming out. We're going to be at the Castle Assassins Academy at the end of February here which is like a two-day event full of seminars of killers. You got Cody Steele, William Tackett, uh, Mario Fonseca, Justin Rennick. They're all doing seminars there. So it's a pretty big event, and it's going to be at a castle. So oh, cool. if you want to see jiu-jitsu at a castle, come buy some reverend stuff in person. It's going to be in Burnett, Texas, I believe. Uh, that's one of the big events we have coming up, or just reverendjujitsu.com. All of our stuff's on there. Awesome. No, for sure. Make sure you guys check it out. Next time we'll have to, and you mentioned early on about music. I've, I'm always down to talk music, man. So oh, man, figure that, that could be a whole podcast in itself, especially if you've got some, some background in that, but really, yeah. really appreciate you taking the time tonight. I know you're busy. You got a lot of things going on. So to spend a, an hour talking shit with me, it uh, means a lot. I appreciate it. Oh man. It's been my pleasure. Like, I love listening to podcasts. So the occasional ones I get to be on from time to time, I'm just like, I get super nervous and I'm like, oh shit, I get to be on what I listen to all the time. Who the hell's going to listen to me? And, you know, people like you that do a great podcast and can hold a conversation, uh, ask the right questions and have fun doing it. Like you make it super easy and make me feel comfortable doing it. And thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh shit, man. Don't be nervous. If you're going to be nervous, I'll leave you with this. Anybody that's listening. So go, if you have not, this is the craziest fucking story. It's so relevant too, because of Bitcoin. So there's a guy, he's, he's a German dude. He lives in San Francisco. He's a software developer for some sort of comp software company in San Fran. And he bought into Bitcoin years ago when the price was super low. And he has it in his his coinbase wallet or his some sort of digital wallet where he has his crypto and he has tried eight times his password and it's been incorrect and he has two more tries otherwise it wipes and in, in like self like implodes basically and he loses these bitcoins right now with oh. the, current, the current value he has 220 million dollars worth of bitcoin that he cannot access. There's no government to call. There's, there's no, nothing he can do. And he says that he remembers writing the password down on a yellow post-it note and he accidentally threw it out. And so, Oh my God, dude. So like, it's, you said, you said nervous. I was like thinking about this all day long. And I've been telling people this story because I've been yelling from the rooftops about Bitcoin and just, you know, from, for a five-year standpoint, I'm, I'm really, really high on it. But I was thinking about, I'm just like, man, I remember getting paid in Bitcoin back in the day when like poker stars, they were like, hey, oh shit, you won like a sit and go and, you know, $50 or you can get paid in, you know, Bitcoin. And I don't know if it was a one for one. It may have even been an incentive to pay you more. But I like traded them in for, you know, I wanted cash. I wanted something I could go, you know, spend that weekend. And it meant absolutely nothing. But this guy like... I don't know when he bought in. I have to go back and read it, but yeah, two more tries. And if he gets it wrong, the money's gone. There's no forgot password option on this shit. Oh my God, dude. That's, you know, I've never bought into Bitcoin. Everybody's like, dude, you got to, you got to. If I log out of Instagram, I have to do forgot password to get back into that. <laughs> Let alone Bitcoin, right? That is insane. $220 million just hit or miss like it's like a lifeline right yeah i think it begs, the question is like if you would you try the last two times or would you like if you if you tried it again i saw that somebody asked this question online they were like 
what if you had tried it nine times and you were wrong? The chances that you're going to guess it right on the 10th time is probably like non, non-existent. Right. Once you do it, it's gone forever. So like, is there part of you that just like doesn't ever do it because there's like still that mindset that like, ah, I have $220 million worth of Bitcoin on (laughs) in this wallet. That's not gone because I didn't and hope that maybe there's some chance that down the road, you'll find a way to get inside of it. Or do you just bite the bullet and get on with life and not let it be your distraction anymore? I would bite the bullet, get on with life because that chance that it might pop in my head one day and then I would have like 330 million would be so much more to me than, than wiping it all out or just knowing that I had that much mm-hmm. still there, I'd be happy with. But if you guess the wrong password that many times, you're not going to guess the right password the 10th try. Like who has that many different passwords for things? Yeah, dude, I couldn't, I would be so sick to my stomach. I, I could not imagine having to be that close yet that far away. Oh, that's bad. Wow. I'm going to look into that story. I was just watching a a thing about somebody Bitcoin mining. I didn't know that was the thing. I know nothing about Bitcoin. I don't know. I don't watch the news. I don't know shit about Bitcoin. I don't know shit about cryptocurrency. It's just things I avoid because it's things that would stress me on the long run. Right. <laughs> so this guy, like this 21 year old kid was living with his mom and had a heart attack, Bitcoin mining. I can only imagine this guy, like he's not even mining. He just has it already and he can't get it in. Like, the day that it all wipes away, it's probably going to have a heart attack. Yeah. My brother was telling me he has a friend who owned a bunch of pizzerias and he sold the pizzerias and took the money and invested them into mining machines. And I, I was kind of ignorant. I understood like a little bit. I get the blockchain methodology and ultimately there's going to be no more Bitcoins to be mined. So there's just like a finite amount of them. So the demand right now, everybody wants Bitcoins, but there's not enough to go around. So the value goes up. It's just kind of at the, at the base level, it's just supply and demand. But he bought these computers that run special algorithms and will mine and create Bitcoin based on the blockchain. But the problem is it like runs up your electric bill. So he's doing all kinds of like math problems to figure out, okay, with these 50 machines that I bought, it's going to cost me like 120 grand for the machines. Every month it's going to run me, you know, $8,000 in electric, but I'll be able to mine, you know, two coins every month. So it'll net me a certain amount of profit. And then if the value goes up, it's just all gravy on top of that. But I'm like, so what? He just like has them in his house. He's like, oh yeah, his whole, his, his living room, his dining room, they're just tables full of computers running nonstop. It's like 150 degrees in the house, fucking meters spinning like crazy. They probably think he's growing weed. Like, you know, it's just, it's crazy, but man, the value it's, it's there. It's just so volatile that, you know, you could, you make the wrong move and, you know, decide to cash in your 401k and put it in Bitcoin. The next day it falls out and you lose everything you ever had. Or you forget your password. (laughs) (laughs) touche (laughs) touche that's so bad i could not imagine forgetting a password without an option to get my password back yeah no man and that's what i saw too with a kid that had a heart attack he's like he had like 50 computers set up yeah so much stress is the risk worth the reward is the payout worth it like yeah especially if you forget your password like imagine how much that guy sacrificed to get the 220 million in bitcoin Right. That's a lot of sacrifice for what could eventually be nothing because you're betting on cloud currency. That's what I was saying. You have the hard drive. Got to back it up with a, with a solid file to pass it on in the long run. Mm -hmm. Cash is always going to be cash. Bitcoin can lose 220 million just for forgetting a password. Man. (laughs) Now I'm, but that's I'm like, 2021. Yeah, now it yeah. is. That's the life we live in anymore. It's like we all knew this currency was coming. Uh, I don't know, man. It could be end times. It could be the beginning of new times. Who knows? 
let's hope that's the beginning of something crazy. Where it goes, I'm hoping for. Who knows? But uh, we'll see where it goes, brother. Yes, sir. Hey, it was great talking to you, Justin. Thank you so much for having me. Likewise, Alex. Looking forward to the next time, my friend. You too. Enjoy your night. Take care. Thanks, buddy.